Hey, this is Kenneth. Last time, we talked about what a repeater was and how you could use it and how it would help you. Um, so if you were on one side of a mountain, you could talk up to this magical thing on top of the mountain and someone else on the other side of it could hear you. But I didn't talk about what was inside of that top of the mountain thing that we call a repeater. Um, it's That wasn't particularly fair of me and most people don't get to see those. So let's talk about, you know, building a repeater and what what you really need to put into it. So, like we mentioned, a repeater consists of a receiver radio, which is somehow connected to an antenna, and a transmit radio, which is also somehow connected to an antenna. Um, it's not always two separate antennas, it's often one antenna, but well, we haven't gotten there yet. So, what the repeater has to somehow do is have the receiver set to your uplink frequency, listening for it, and whenever it hears something, somehow pass the audio that it is hearing to the transmitter to be retransmitted, and key up the transmitter and say, hey, I'm hearing this audio right now, you should transmit it. All right? And so literally, you know, with this being one radio, something like a Motorola GM300 would be a good example, although, I mean, you would you wouldn't want to use like a little Baofeng handheld in, in the, a repeater um, just because they tend not to be well built to the standards you want for a repeater. Although it is possible, I've seen people do it, it is usually disappointing. Um, but so between the re receiver and the transmitter, the re transmitter would then happen to just be set on your downlink frequency, you would have an audio line. And this is, we're, we're going to start building, building up from here. So I mean, most simply, you can have an audio line going from your receiver to your transmitter. And then good radios for repeater service will out of the out of the receive radio will also have what's called the COR or carrier operated relay. Um, traditionally this was an actual mechanical relay that went click. Um, usually now it is a FET or a transistor of some sort or some sort of switch. It is a output from this radio that goes low when it is receiving the intended signal, right? And so it would be, so in the TDM's case, the receive radio is listening on 445.15, 445.150 megahertz with the PL of 100 hertz. And so if it happened to hear that, um, the audio that is, it is receiving would get piped over to the transmitter and the COR line would go low, which traditionally go low. I mean, you, radios will usually support setting the polarity for it either way you want, but m most push to talk inputs, right? So like when you want to key up your radio, you have to push a button. That button in, button's input to the radio tends to be low. And so if you were to literally just take two radios, connect the speaker of one to the microphone input of the other, usually with a attenuator of some sort there, you know, a couple, like two resistors, and you were to wire the carrier operated relay output to the push to talk on the other, it would actually repeat. There's many problems with this, and you will tend not to see them this simply, but it's actually not, not out of the realm of possibilities, and I have deployed re repeaters like this very temporarily. Um, the first problem is you're listening here for very, very weak signals. And I, I, I say weak just because when you are talking to someone on the other side of town, uh, your five watts divided by the square of the distance you're going over means that w the signal coming into the receiver here is on the order of microvolts, right? So when you have microvolts going into your receiver and only five megahertz away, so this would be your 440.150 megahertz. Only five megahertz away from it, you have a transmitter transmitting it. In our case, it is 11 watts, but it's, in any case, it is many orders of magnitude more than what's coming in, right? So you're trying to listen very carefully to someone whispering at you from across town while your buddy here is shouting it right next to your ear. And so you need some sort of isolation so that this rate radio doesn't desense your receiver. Um, there's 
several different ways to do that. There's other issues that, you know, you're, you have no form of identification here, and so the, the FCC will require this repeater to somehow identify, and there's nothing here doing it. Um, if something were to go wrong and like your carry operator relay would get stuck, um, your transmitter would key continuously. Um, there's all sorts of issues here. All right, so let's let's grapple with the interfacing between the two radios, and then we'll talk about um, how to deal with this RF issue that your transmitter is desensing your receiver, uh, which would make it no longer able to hear the person talking to you, um, and is uh, easily kind of diagnosed by when you key up a repeater that is having this sort of desense issue. It would go because it would hear you go ah, I need to I need to key up. But we'll get to that later um, and it's a cycle so let's go back draw again here's our receiver it's got its carrier operated relay we have our transmitter with its push to talk button so the audio lines could still get piped straight through but instead of the carrier operated relay going straight to the push to talk, let's have it go through some sort of timer, like a little three minute timer. And so when the COR goes low, this three minute timer starts and also takes the push to talk line low. Three minutes later, if the COR still hasn't let up, which means that either some old ham is yakking away on your repeater um, or something has gone horrifically wrong with your receiver, um, it unkeys the transmitter and then just sits there quietly, um, waiting for the COR to eventually come back high, um, or for you to haul your ass up to the mountain and fix your repeater that has now stopped working. Right? And so this, uh, this is often called a timeout timer or TOT. The timeout timer, three minutes is not an unusual number. You can pick anything you want. And it tends to be a fail-safe that protects your transmitter because repeater transmitters tend to be designed to be keyed for quite long times, quite often. Um, your typical handheld or mobile car radio without much extra cooling um, would tend to blow up or melt or die in various forms if they were put into tough repeater service. Um, and so this T timeout timer or TOT protects even the most robust radio from some sort of meltdown or excessive wear or what have you. Um, the other issue that we mentioned was that we need some sort of identification. So you would, it would often be on the same circuit board, but you would have what's called an identifier or an ID -er, or I think ID idiomatic is a common standalone board that it would also be listening for the COR. Right, so in the specific case of a, a American amateur repeater, you're required to ID, ID every 10 minutes. So you could have this ID circuit that just listens to the COR, you know, just watches the COR line. If it goes low, it starts a 10 minute timer. And when that timer expires, it also, it keys the transmitter and pipes audio, uh, I didn't draw this particularly well, and pipes audio into the transmitter like so. All right, um, the simplest ones, you could, you could build this with a little Arduino that beeps out Morse code. Um, many of the commercial controllers will actually voice synthesize, this is the W6TDM repeater, or what have you. Um, and so there, there's your identification, right? Uh, of course, when you've got a audio line and a receive line coming in, you can do all sorts of interesting things here as well. And so what you will all also often see is the audio line going into some sort of remote control box, right? And th this is not strictly necessary at this point, but something you will often see. Um, that you can remotely control anything else from a repeater input. Uh, I've, I've done a demo video before on a DTMF decoder chip that you could then feed into your 
microcontroller if you were building your own. Um, I have seen them used to interconnect the repeater with telephones. You can do it to remotely turn it on and off systems. Uh, you can remotely use it to remotely turn, turn on and off the entire repeater. Uh, you can use it to turn off Christmas lights. I mean, the, 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 the possibilities here are, are pretty much only limited by what you're willing to implement, but all of this can kind of be summarized by what you will usually see, which is your receiver with its COR being piped into a repeater controller which then is piped into the transmitter with its push to talk like so. Um, a popular manufacturer of these repeater controllers uh, that I use quite a bit is RLC um, and Zetron is another company that I've experienced with um, as well. Um, you will also sometimes see this whole receiver, repeater controller, transmitter um, packaged as a single device um, that would then only have the two antenna ports coming off. Um, and an example of that would be something like the GR1225 or the Ken, uh, so that's a Motorola part or the uh, Kenwood like TKR. 750 or 8, 850, oh, my pen is dying, um, 750 repeat, uh, repeater. So RLC makes great controllers that you can interface any two radios you want. Zetron makes um, some as well. But the GR1225 is kind of my bread and butter portable uh, repeater, and the TKR750 and the 850 are real workhorse 50-watt repeaters that happen to have a built-in basic controller as well. Right. So that, that solves the whole audio control and control issue between your receiver and your transmitter, but we hadn't talked about this whole desense issue where you're trying, you're trying to listen to a whisper while shouting out the other ear as well. Um, and that's where repeaters actually tend to be the most difficult because the amount of filtering that you need to have between these is on the order of 70 decibels, which is seven orders of magnitude. Um, and so the most popular way to go about this is incredibly expensive and it uses what's called a duplexer. A duplexer is a box with three ports. One of them would go to your antenna, one of them goes to your receiver, and one of them goes to your transmitter. Right, and there's all sorts of stuff between them here, which we just talked about. But the duplexer essentially um, filters between the receive port and the antenna port all the transmit power, and filters between the transmit port and the antenna port all the receive power. Right, And so as you're trying to listen to someone shouting here, it filters out. It, it's, you're trying to listen to someone quietly while shouting. It, this duplexer blocks with it kind of my rule of thumb is you want at least 70 db of isolation between this port and this port All right and so let's talk about why you kind of want to have the, the filtering for people tends to be relatively intuitive for the antenna to the receiver because you want to filter out the transmit power but why filter out the received power between the transmitter and the antenna All right so let's look at the spectrum of the transmitter, right? And so our, tr our transmitter is on 440150 and our receiver is on 445150. In an ideal world, the amount of power coming out of the transmitter would be this nice rectangle right here, which is, you know, 440.150, you know, with the bandwidth of the signal, which is, you know, your 25 kilohertz, and that's all you would get. Um, this is very much, unfortunately, not at all the case, uh, and the FCC specifies limits for this, but they are not uh, for out of what's called out of band, because really what you see is something on the order of 
this, as you're putting out quite a bit more power wider than what you tran you know than just this one channel. Um, this tends to already be quite low, and so um, it it's the FCC mandates that this has to be quite low, so you wouldn't normally notice it. But since this transmitter is electrically connected to the receiver, um, it's a big deal. And so by filtering out this section of the transmitter, you're reducing the energy that could interfere with the receiver, because the receiver is only listening here. All right, and so the transmitter gets filtered so that on here it is more so just the trans this the actual deliberate signal and less of this. And then from the antenna port here, we're, we're listening to you know whatever is coming in on the antenna and we filter out all of this power just because putting 11 watts of RF power into any radio's receiver um, will tend to do damage as well. So the receiver is only going to hear the, this portion here. Um, the disadvantages of this duplexer, which is often, the duplexer is often built with what are called cavity filters. So it's a resonant cavity that you can tune with you know, little silver rods that you can screw in and out. Um, it tends to be relatively expensive. A very cheap, bad duplexer will cost you on the order of 150 to uh, about $150. Uh, an actual nice one that you know won't be d completely disappointing. You're talking more on the order of 600 to a couple thousand dollars for this duplexer filter. Um, and so there's other ways to get the 70 dB of isolation. One of them is just physical distance. Right. So if here is our tower on the top of the mountain, right, um, and you put one of your antennas up on the top of the tower, and you put the other antenna down on the bottom of the tower, you can actually achieve enough distance between these two antennas like this to get your 70 dB of isolation. So um, you actually will oftentimes, you know, so I, I kind of said that you, you won't often see these two antennas like that, but you know, actually sometimes you will. Um, they'll usually be vertically separated like this because it, um, and, and the separation here is it's on the order of you know, 50 to 150 feet um, needed. Uh, you can have it vertically because horizontal isolation, they t you're, we're talking at that point about a couple thousand feet typically, which is problematic, right? And so just by putting, typically you would put your receive up higher and you put your transmit lower. Um, by having these two antennas separate like that, uh, you can get the same level of isolation. Um, at complicated radio sites, you can actually share this, this one receive antenna between multiple different repeaters, and then each one of them can, you know, transmit on their own transmit antenna down at the bottom. It gets a little bit hairy, and that's a whole other kettle of fish, so let's not talk about that now. Um, the, other, the other kind of way around this is what's called a crossband repeater, um, which... Instead of it being two frequencies like 440 to you know 445 megahertz, why not have it go from 440 down to 146 megahertz? Right. Suddenly, instead of needing these duplex filters, which need to filter out something only five megahertz away, we're at something that's you know an order of three away. Right. Is to filter out this, all we need to do is have a low-pass filter right above this that at three times it, its frequency cuts it out by 70 dB. Um, this, is, this can be accomplished either, again, by basic filtering the radio and two separate antennas, or what you'll often see is I'm using what's called a diplexer. So this literally just has inside of it um, a couple capacitors and inductors and three antenna ports, one of them being the common, and then one of them, you know, so like this one happens to be that the first port passes 1.3 to 225 megahertz, and the other port passes 350 to 540, right? And so if I were to building a crossband repeater, I would wire up the UHF radio here and the VHF radio here 
stick an antenna there. And this, what, 20, I think it was $25 for one of these, gives me the same level of isolation as this. Uh, the, the, you know, the inconvenience being that you're across two very different frequencies. Um, Crossband repeaters actually tend to be built into uh, mobile radios. It's like my truck's radio happens to just support crossband repeater mode. Um, another, uh, another option tends not to be very popular because people like to both talk and listen on the same band. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of an overview of this. Uh, there is another three hours worth of talking about how to configure the repeater controllers and tune them up. And if you wanted to build one yourself, that's a whole other project. Um, and the advantages of different different ways of tuning this stuff. But I figured that was kind of a, a good introduction to the internals conceptually. Um, and if there's enough positive response to this video, I might actually start picking apart some of the systems I have around here in my apartment and showing you really you know what this stuff physically looks like and you know eventually possibly even build my own. But thanks for watching, and any questions, leave them in the comments, and I shall talk to you later.